Luke's Gospel, chapter 8, it says, It came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting on him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had one only daughter, about twelve years of age, and she lay dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. And a woman having an issue of blood twelve years had spent all of her living upon physicians, neither could any, could neither could be healed of any. And came and behind him touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stands. And Jesus said, Who touched me? And all the night, and Peter, and then they that were with him said, Master, the multitude brought thee and pressed thee, and thou sayest, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman was not his, she came trembling and falling down before him. And she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. While he yet spake, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue's house coming one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead, trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John, the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her, and he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed in the storm, knowing she was dead. And he put them all out, and he took her by the hand, and called, saying, Made her rise. And the spirit, her spirit came again, and she rose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you. We might be able to look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith, for those things that we stand in need of this day. We thank you for each one that come uh, this way by our congregation this morning to hear the word of God and to just assemble together. We thank you for each one. We thank you for those that are listening on Facebook this morning and, and mentor. I pray, God, that you would just pour into your spirit, into your servant this morning. I might be able to rightly divide the word of truth and it may go forth to the waiting congregation and it might bring hope and it might bring comfort, it might bring encouragement, it might bring faith. God, I pray that you would just begin to work and move that we might be able to leave here today saying it was good to have come to the house of the Lord. Lord, I pray that you'll empty me out of myself. Fill me with your spirit. Guide my words. And God, I pray that you'll just be careful, help me to be careful to just be able to rightly divide the word of truth that it may go forth and do your perfect will. And we're going to give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. We ask all these favors and blessings in Christ's true and holy name we do pray. And all God's people say it. Amen. 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 You know, this is an interesting passage of Scripture, and it's kind of like a two-for-one there. Um, we've, well, we've probably preached about the little lady before with the issue of blood. I think it hasn't been that long. So we've all kind of, that's just kind of embedded right in the middle of this passage of Scripture. And why is that? You know, you ask that question. Why would God choose to allow the writer to pen these words and, and kind of have one miracle embedded in the midst of a, another story? And I think as we begin to look at that, there, there's some real meaning there. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But uh, that's not the key passage of Scripture that we want to key in on. Uh, that's another sermon for another day. I, we, we've preached it before, but I will touch on it. But I want to look at Jerry. So I want to look at his, him and his daughter. I want to look at that situation and kind of help us to understand as we unpack the Word of God this morning exactly what we need to take away from this. Now, as we begin to look, we go back to verse 40. And we find Jesus has come back from the other side of the lake. And here he is. He's, he's come back in the boat. And the people's heard that he's, he's come back. And a great crowd is gathered together. Uh, the story begins with an awaiting crowd. And as we see this, uh, they're waiting on Jesus. And we begin to understand that Jesus steps off the boat. And we see a man pushing through the crowd. We see a great crowd that's there. And we see this man just pushing, 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 trying to get to Jesus and maybe the people are responding, you know, what is up with this guy? What's wrong with him? Hey, wait your turn, you know. I can see the, the animosity building. I can see, you know, <laughs> some friction between him and some of the other people maybe that are, that are gathered there. And, and you begin to look at this and you say, well, what is up with this guy? But I see as we, we see the rest of the story, he runs to Jesus and he falls down at his feet. And I think as we see this, we see desperation. 
We see a man that's in despair. We see a man that's come to the end of himself and he's looking for answers. He's looking for a solution to a, to a problem. And, and, and the gospel writer even gives us his name. Now, you go back to the Bible and you start looking at miracles. A lot of times it'll just state a miracle in a man or a woman like just the, little, the lady with the issue of blood. We don't know her name. We don't know who she was. We don't know her name. We just know that it was a lady with an issue of blood. The man with a paralyzed head, I'm just going to pick out a few. We don't know who he was. Very seldom do we get names to go with these miracles. But the interesting thing about it, we get a name here. The gospel writer gives us a name, and most of them are unnamed, but Jairus. Now, you think about that, so okay, we got a name. Now, that don't really mean a whole lot to us. Because it's not like we say, oh yeah, you know, Jairus. I mean, 2,000 years later, we read this and say, oh yeah, that was old so-and-so son. That don't, that don't ring a bell with us. I mean, don't say it good. We don't know Jairus from Adam. We don't know who he is. That name don't really come together in our mind and tell us anything about Jairus. But we get just a little bit more about Jairus. We not only get his name, but as we continue to unpack his story, we get his occupation, we get his job title, we get his position. Now that tells us a little bit more. And I think as we begin to see this, because of his position, he, he kind of has, he was steeped in protocol, he was steeped in rituals, he was a religious leader. I'm going to go back to verse 40 and read this. And it said, it came to pass when Jesus returned, the people that had received him, for they were all waiting on him. And behold, there came a man named Jerry. He was a ruler of the synagogue. And as we see this, we see that he had a position, he had a title, and because of this, because of who he was, people knew him, everyone knew him, and he had a lot on the line. He put it all out there on the line. He was risking his reputation, his, his job, his, his financial security. He was risking it all to push through this crowd to get to where Jesus was at, and a lot of religious leaders were not real responsive to Jesus. They kind of considered him as a, as a backcountry preacher or teacher that had a, a great way of expounding on, on the Word of God. But they had, had never really come to grips that he was the Son of God. They never really come to, to grips that he was the Messiah, that he was anything other than some teacher. And they began to look at him that way, and it was really difficult, I'm sure, for Jairus to come to this man, to come to Jesus, and, and, and humble himself at his feet. Everybody's watching him, everybody's looking at him, everybody's talking about him, but he put it all on the line. And he wonders, well, what would do that? Why would he do that? And I think we, we find that answer as we, as we read on into this passage of Scripture. And it said in verse 42, this is, this is why he did this. He said, if he had one and only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay dying, but as he went, the people thronged him. Now, as we see this, Desperation will cause you to do a lot of things, especially when it comes to your children. It'll cause you to lay down your pride, your dignity, and everything else, and, and do whatever it takes to, for the best interest of your children. As we begin to look at this, he had one daughter. And he had this daughter, and she was dying. She was 12 years old, and he had tried everything that he could possibly do. He had come to the end of himself, and here he was in a point of desperation in his life. He pushed through this crowd, and he came to Jesus, and he said, Hey, I need you to go to my house because my daughter is dying. If you don't come to my house, she's going to die. And as you begin, we begin to see this, we begin to understand that he didn't say, Hey, you know, <clears throat> that if she is sick, she may recover, she may not know. He said, she's dying. She's not just sick. She's going to die. If you don't come, she's going to die. Do we see that desperation? Do we see what he's up against? And do we see why he's acting? See his despair? And I think that he runs through the crowd. He falls down at Jesus' feet. He pleads with him to come to his house. And, and, and Jairus has, <clears throat> has heard of where Jesus was. And he, he, he gets to the seashore. The crowd's already gathered there. And here they are, uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus has not yet arrived, and, and, and you can imagine Jesus is waiting with great expectation. I get a picture of him, the crowd's already gathered, Jesus is out here on the boat, and he's pacing, waiting, pacing, waiting, just knowing if he can get to Jesus and get Jesus to his house, time is of essence. Very important that Jesus does this and does it quickly. It's one of those, you know, Prayers that we pray out of desperation. God, we need this now. 
Because we're in trouble. God, we need you to, we need you to do something right now. We need you expediently, quickly. We need you to expedite this. And, and I think as we, we see this, he's waiting with great expectation, thinking, Jesus, you need to come on. At time, at times of this is so you really need to come on. And finally Jesus steps off the boat. And in the sense of belief, kind of overshadows there is, and here he is. He walks up to where Jesus is at, or runs up to where Jesus is at, and he falls at his feet, and he's thinking, man, this is going to be good now. That glimmer of hope and, it has come up in his life, and he, he's been just kind of, at a point, it's going to be good. He's got a peace, and everything's good. Jesus is here. Jesus is going to head to my house, and, and then he's going to heal my daughter. I've heard her after he's healed the, the multitude of people. It's going to be good. You ever pray and got that glimmer of hope and everything seemed to be good and then all of a sudden things turn? This is kind of where it's at. This is kind of the story. And I think in, in the last part of verse 42, we, we see that they are on the way to Jairus' house. I'll read it. It says, uh, for his woman only daughter about 12 years age, she lay dying. But as he went, the people from him. So they're on their way. They're moving. Jairus is, is playing this case. He's told Jesus what's going on. And Jesus has agreed to go to his house. So they're moving. The crowd is, is not just Jairus and, and Jesus and walking side by side. We see a crowd of people that are headed toward Jairus' house. And here they are. They're going. And Jairus is kind of leading the way. And as we see this, we kind of get a picture of Jesus looking at Jairus and Jairus kind of walking ahead. You, you can only imagine Jairus is probably taking about three steps to the rest of the point. Jesus is kind of walking with the crowd. Here Jairus and he's walking ahead and he's looking back and he's stopping. He's waiting like, come on, come on, come on, come on. we got to go. And, and I mean, he'll take a few more steps and the same thing. He repeats this over and over and over again. And, and all of a sudden here we see that he's, <clears throat> he gets up here and finally he looks back and they're stopped. He looks back, the crowd stopped, Jesus has stopped in verses, three, four, verses 43 through 47. There's kind of a shift in the story, and that's where we pick up with this little woman with the issue of blood. So here Jesus is, he's looking back, and all of a sudden he sees that the crowd stopped, Jesus has stopped, and he's like, oh my, what are they doing? And let's read verses 43 through verse 47 really quickly. And it says that, as he went on through the, the crowd, they thronged him. And in verse 43, it said, The woman had an issue of blood for 12 years. She spent all of her living upon physicians. Neither could be healed of any. Came behind him and touched the border of his garment. And immediately, her issue of blood stands. And Jesus said, Who touched me? And all the night, Peter and all that were with him, said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee. And said, Thou sayest, Who touched me? Jesus said, Somebody had touched me, for I perceived that virtue has come and gone out of me. And then when the woman saw that she was not here, she came trembling, falling down before him, and declared unto her before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Now, as we begin to look at that passage of Scripture, we can just kind of take those few verses right there and preach an entirely different sermon, preach something that was, that was, that was up different from this, but yet it's in the same way it has to it was tied together. And you just wonder so many times when we read this, why is this kind of tucked right in the middle of that? Well, you can only imagine when Jerry saw it. You can only imagine his, his despair kind of just begin to overwhelm him again, and he's thinking, you know, we, we were on the right track. We were headed to my house, but now here this little lady has came and touch Jesus. Not only did she just touch him, isn't it? Not enough that she could just touch him and be healed. But he stopped. And he's going to carry on the conversation with this. He's going to poll the crowd to find out who touched him. And as we see this, we can see it's, it's just, he's just beginning to get overwhelmed again. You ever been in a hurry and someone, maybe this is just me, I don't know. Y'all, you ever been in a hurry and someone in front of you wants to drive about 20 miles an hour? I, I about come in again sometimes. <laughs> Get out of my way. Oh, uh, maybe not just just me. But you think about that. This is kind of where he's at. I mean, he's thinking, would you please come on? I need to get to my house. I mean, we see his urgency. We see that it, 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 it's almost selfishness on his part. But, I mean, he's, a, he's in a position of despair. I mean, he's thinking, my child is going to die. If you don't let him, Jesus go, and he'll get to my house, 
And, and I think, you know, the people's everywhere, and, and Jesus is, he's just kind of carrying on this conversation right here in the middle of this shift of the story. And, and as we begin to look at that, long story short, Jesus heals the lady with the issue of blood, calls her out to identify her publicly. And, but notice what happens in verse 49. As we read this, it says in verse 49, but while he yet spake. Now this is Jesus. He's talking to this lady, having a conversation. There cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. He said, but while he yet spake, someone come from his house and said, There's no need to bother Jesus anymore. Your daughter has just died. All the hope, all the faith that he had just died with his daughter. Everything that he had put his hope and faith in, he was waiting to get to his house. He just knew that everything was going to be good. It died. Now we, we shift from a, from a story of hope to a, to a story of what ifs. You know, so many times when things don't line up the way we think it should, it's a million questions. Well, what if? What did I do wrong? Or what did someone else do wrong? Or what if this had happened? We begin to put all these what ifs in place, trying to make things differently. And, and as we see this, I mean, there could have been a million. He said, well, what if? What if they'd have had a faster boat? What if the wind had been blowing from a different direction? It would have pushed them a little faster. What if that crowd hadn't been there, by the way? What if Jesus had just heard me the first time before I pushed through the crowd? What if that lady had never been there? What if she had never stopped? What if Jesus had never had a conversation with her? Me and what if could have happened? I mean, he, he begins to rehearse these in his mind. So we go from a story of faith, we go from a story of, of hope to a, to a story of, of what if. And that's what we see this. And Jesus kind of overhears this in verse 50 as we, they're talking and he's there kind of whispering. He overhears their whispers. You can only imagine the guy walks up to him and he's whispered to, to Jerry and says, Look, there's no need to, to bother him anymore. Your daughter's just died. And Jesus overhears this. And now we see another shift in the story. Notice this in verse 50. He said, But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. Notice how up until this point, we get a picture of Jairus walking ahead of Jesus, looking back, walking ahead of Jesus, looking back, walking ahead of Jesus, looking back, kind of urging Jesus on. But at this point, Jesus has stopped. Jairus has stopped. And all of a sudden, it's like, it was real easy for Jairus to just go home. Thank you, Jesus. It was a good day. It's, it's okay. It's all good. And walk away. But notice what Jesus did in verse 50. He goes up to him, and it's almost like Jairus was leading Jesus up into this point, and now it's like Jesus just took the role. He's changed roles with him, and Jesus is leading Jairus at this point. And they kind of swap positions here, and he goes gets some conversation with him. He says these words. He says, Jairus, he said, fear not. Believe only, and she shall be made whole. Now, as we see this, we see Jesus leading him, saying, fear not. Believe, and she shall be made whole. Now, understand this. In this culture, they understood li very little about sickness. They didn't have a lot of medical resources. They didn't have a lot of doctors. They didn't have a lot of people that could diagnose diseases. But they, they didn't know a lot about sickness. But they knew a lot about death. They had seen a lot of people die. In that day and age, the culture that they lived in, the mortality rate was huge for for. Infants on up to, you know, 15, 16, 17 years old. If you could kind of make it past that 16, 17 year old mark, you, you were kind of home free on dying. But, but there was a lot of mortality in that age group from, a, from infancy on up to, you know, mid teenage years. And they had seen a lot of dying. And, and Jerry knew this. He knew 12 years old. He said, hey, there's a good chance she's not going to make it. You think about in our culture, it's a lot of times it's the, the elderly that more susceptible to things like this. But in that culture, it was it was the young people. And he, had, he knew that if Jesus didn't intervene here, that there was a real, real good possibility she was going to die. And it, it, it happened just like he had it, it expected. And, and I think if you begin to see this here, Jerry, he's kind of 
come to this realization. He said, I don't know a whole lot about sickness. I don't know a lot about, you know, treating disease, but I do know a lot about death. And this is exactly what I was expecting to happen. This is exactly what I knew was going to happen if Jesus didn't intervene. And now it's happened. I did everything I could do. I went there. I tried to get him there. I, I, I did all of these things, and it, and it just didn't work out. And now Jesus is beginning to urge him. So what we see here is a situation that was bad, but, you know, it seemed to be getting worse, and, and, and now it's done. It's like nothing else can be done. You know, nobody expected Jesus to say, okay, that's okay. She's dead. I have power over that. Nobody expected him to respond in this way. I mean, you know, they expected, hey, as long as there was an inkling of life left there, as long as there was a thread of life, then Jesus would be able to step up and lay his hands on her and speak words of life. And that life would intensify and she would go back to being normal. But once she was dead, they had no hope, no faith, no, no confidence whatsoever in her ever being able to live again. And, and I think as we see this, hope and faith was strong up until this point until we got the words that she had died. And now they're at a point of no return, so it seems. It seems like this is the end, and, and, and what, <clears throat> what they saw was a powerful Jesus that, that had power to heal those that were sick. And in their mind, they had put limitations on what Jesus could do. In their mind, they had kind of put parameters. They had put Jesus in this box, and they said, He has power up until this point, up until these parameters right here. But outside of these parameters, when it gets beyond this, and there's no hope. Now think about that for just a moment. Sometimes in our prayer life, sometimes when we seek God, sometimes we get to a point that we, we have this preconceived idea of how Jesus is going to do it, and we've got these parameters that we put up and say, well, Jesus can do it up until this point. But once it goes past that, once we get beyond this point, there's no hope. And I think as we begin to see this, this is where Jairus and, and the crowd that was with him, and they put limitations on him, and we do the same thing sometimes. We just kind of say, okay, you know, Jesus is very limited in what he can do. No, Jesus is not limited in what he can do. Jesus is Jesus. Jesus don't, you know, when we talk about uh, the, the demonic man that's calling the storm the last couple of weeks. We talk about Jesus didn't have to call on God. Remember, he didn't just step up to the front of that boat and say, hey, I'm going to call on the power of God to come and, and, and calm these waves. He didn't look at that demonic man that was on could dare with all of those demons in it and walk up to him and say, in the name of God, get out of here. He didn't do that. He had that power in and of himself. He walked up with the power he had. He spoke to the waves. He walked up with the power that he had. He spoke to the demons and they fled. Now, as we see this, we begin to look at Jerry thinking about Jesus and thinking about, oh, he's limited on power. No, he's full of power. He's full of the authority. He has the authority to go beyond what we can even imagine or think in our little finite minds sometimes. So have you ever thought about that when things don't go as the way we expect them to? We're expecting Jesus to do something big in our life, and then for whatever reason, it don't play out that way. And, and, and maybe you just kind of get upset or we get... Yeah, you know, just kind of undone. But have you ever thought that maybe Jesus, we was expecting Jesus to do something big, but have you ever thought maybe Jesus was wanting to do something bigger? You ever thought maybe we was expecting him to do something, you know, real religious and profound? But he was, he was wanting to do something even greater. And sometimes I think that we get to that point in our life where our expectation don't line up with what we're thinking. And all of a sudden, when we get to that point, we just kind of give up hope. We get to a point where we say, well, it, it can't go any further here. My situation is too far gone. My situation is out of the realm and the reach of what Jesus is able to do. That's above his pay grade, so to speak. No. Not happening at all. It, this, you know, as we think about this miracle, now let's kind of look at what he's doing here. This miracle here is not just so that, that this little girl can be healed. Remember we talked about miracles and the, kind of the anatomy of a miracle and dissecting a, a miracle of what would happen. Why Jesus did these things? It was Jesus would do these things to point them to something bigger. 
Miracles, you never see him just going around doing random miracles. He was very <clears throat> methodical. He was very intentional when he was doing miracles. And they were always pointing to something bigger or they were either uh, validating who he was. Now, as we think about this <clears throat> miracle, what he's trying to show them, and Jairus is a ruler of the synagogue, and Jairus is a, is a really good candidate for this miracle, that he might be able to go back and tell his colleagues about Jesus and what power Jesus has, but he wants him to tell it from a realm of a spiritual redemption. He don't want him to just say, hey, you know, this man can walk around, and he can speak life back into people. That's not, that was not Jesus' mission. He didn't just come, and I thank God that he didn't just come, but, you know, it would have been a sad day if Jesus had stepped up and, 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 and 30 years old and began to heal people and he lived, you know, just a few years, and he healed a lot of people along the way, but never went to the cross. That would have been sad for us. That would have left us hopeless and helpless. If he had just been the Jesus of that generation, or the Jesus of that culture, or the Jesus of that particular timeline. But no, Jesus had a greater mission than that. And this is what he's trying to show Jerry. He said, look, he said, you've got this idea that I can only heal the sick, but I'm going to do something great. I want to show you, I want to point you to something bigger than that. I want you to point you, I want to point you to my mission. I want to point you to who I am and what I came for, and that is to bring life and life more abundantly to a lost and dying world. So as he begins to see this, he's trying to he's trying to point Jairus in the right direction so Jairus can maybe go back and tell his colleagues because his colleagues are having a hard time with Jesus. They're having a hard time trying to, to wrap their mind around that he truly is the Son of God, that he's the Messiah, that he's the one the prophets have been speaking of for all of those years because they had their mind wrapped around this idea that he was going to come, he was going to come in power, he was going to come as a, as a ruling and reigning authority. And as we begin to see this, Jesus is trying to ever so subtly point them to who he is and the power that he has. So he's pointing them to something bigger. And in the resurrection, that's, that's hope that we can all have. And that's not just something that was in Jesus' day or the people of that culture, but it's something that we can all have. We have that hope in the resurrection. And you think about verse 51, we'll kind of move on just a little bit. And it says this, when he came to the house, he suffered that no man go in, save Peter and James and John and the father and the mother of the maiden. Now, let's think about this for just a moment. Funerals in that day. Not a lot different than they are today, but sometimes we see funerals get prolonged. And we have the ability to prolong funerals because of, if there's people that are, you know, way off or whatever, that it's going to take some travel time for them to get here. Or if there's, you know, existing circumstances, circumstances beyond our control, uh, I have seen funerals be prolonged because it's so wet to keep their graves. I mean, we have the ability to, you know, hold people for a while. They didn't have that ability. Funerals went very quickly in that day. They would uh, maybe 24 hours and they were kind of, you know, done with it. They didn't have morticians. They didn't have embalming. They didn't have air conditioning. They didn't have coolers that they could put people in. They didn't have any way of preserving the body other than the fact that they would take spices. And you remember they talked about that with Jesus when the ladies come to anoint his body with spices. They would take these spices and they would rub them on the body. They would wrap them in grave clothes. And as we see, that was about the extent of what they could offer. So funerals went very quickly. So by the time everybody has heard that Jairus' daughter had died in verse 51, he came to the house and everybody's there. By the time Jairus gets back, I mean, the Everybody. The family's there. The mourners are there. Everybody. The whole community has gathered there in Jairus' house. And Jesus walks up with Jairus and the disciples, and, and they look around, and they're, everybody's there. And notice what happened and how it kind of plays out from here. As we see this in verse 52. Let me go back to verse 51 and read it, then we'll go into 52. And when he came to the house, he suffered no men to go in and say, Peter, James, and John, and the father. Of the mother and mother of the maiden. And they all wept and beheld her and said, We he said, We not, she is not dead, but sleeping. Now Jesus is having this conversation, maybe inside the house. There's a he didn't he didn't kind of call the mother and father all, all over the side and say, It's gonna be all right, she's just asleep. 
He has this conversation in the midst of everybody. Now, I don't, know, I don't think he just went in there and blurted it out. I believe he was kind of, you know, and he's trying to be kind of confidential and kind of seclusive with it. But they heard it. And when they heard this, the Bible says, that's what's in verse 53, and they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. Can you imagine these, these, these naysayers, so to speak, all these people that were standing around, they are laughing at Jesus saying, he lost it. We know she's dead. Everybody here knows she's dead. Why can't you see that? Who is this guy? What's up with him? He can't even tell. He don't, he's never seen dead folks before. I mean, you know, you get, you get a picture of them beginning to lock in or laugh at him. And notice what he said. It said in verse 54 that he put them out. He put them all out. Now, that's a, I had to do a little, a little reading on that to understand that. It sounds like if you really want to kind of be politically correct on that, then Jesus walked in there and said, hey, guys, I'm going to really need to talk to this family for a while. Can I get y'all to maybe just step outside now? We don't see that at all. I get a picture of Jesus saying, get out. Get out now. I get a picture of, of him, you know, saying, no, we're, I'm not violent. Get out. We know that Jesus had that ability. We know he turned over the tables of the money changers there in the temple. We know that, that, that he could be bold when he needed to be. He could be humble when he needed to be, but he could be bold when he needed to be bold. And I believe this is one of his bold moments. Get out. Get out now. And, and as we see this, then he takes in verse 53, or verse 54, or he, took a, he took her by the hand, and he called, saying, May arise. As we look at that, he, he says, made the rise. And the interesting thing about that, what happens after this, so the Spirit, verse 55, said that her spirit came to him, she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her something to eat. Now, why did that? You, you sometimes you just wonder why things are, are in the Bible, why things are there. And remember, we've talked about that before. I don't believe anything's there by happenstance or just because it was just sounding good or. No. I believe it was there because you begin to overlay these Gospels and you see some things that are different from each writer's standpoint or each writer's point of view sometimes. I mean, if I give each one of you a piece of paper and a pencil and told you to write down, you know, the, the service today, what all happened, we would get, you know, how we know, and here we would get that many different views of it. So you got different writers getting different views of it, but a lot of times you'll see the same writer's make the same point. They'll, they'll, they'll kind of key in on the same point. And it was interesting that they said, give her something to eat. Now as we see this, we see that there's other resurrections that are recorded in the Gospels and I'll kind of touch on them for just a moment, but let's just think about the widow at name. When this, they were going down the street and here they were, Jesus walks up, touches the coffin, and told, tells the boy to arrive, and he began to talk. He began to have conversations. If you read a little further, you find about Lazarus. When Lazarus had died, Mary Martha's brother. And when he was a friend of Jesus, they called on Jesus. Remember the story, it's four days later. It's kind of very similar to this story right here. All hope was gone. They come to a point of, of no return. And Jesus, Mary and Martha even expressed that. As he come there, said, if he's been here, he's not died. Jesus told him, he said, I, he'll, he'll live again at the resurrection. And they said, yeah, it's a general resurrection. Yeah, he will live again. He said, no, you don't understand. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. But as we see this, what happened is when <clears throat> Lazarus, when, he, when his life began to come back into him and his body began to warm and his blood began to move and his decaying flesh began to, to, to be regenerated, we see something that he walks out. <clears throat> he still got all, all these grave clothes hanging on him. And they said, Take off those gray clothes. Get those gray clothes off of him. And it's interesting that they said for them to give this little girl something to eat. You think about the widow's son at Nain. It, it, the gospel, that's what it does. When, when there's a rebirth in our life and we're born again, it changes our conversation. It changes the way we talk. It changes the way that we interact. It changes the, the, the ability of us to say things that are, that are normally we wouldn't say. And then I think about Lazarus. The gospel changes our appearance. We don't look like where we've been. We don't smell like where we've been. I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The Bible says that they were cast into the furnace and it was seven times hotter than it, than it ever was. The people that threw them in, they actually got burned up and 
And, and the king looked over in there and he said, did y'all not throw in three? So I see four of them walking around and one of them looks like the son of God. And as we see that story, they come out and the Bible says that their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people go through a lot of stuff in life. A lot of people smell like where they've been. Because they talk about it constantly, where they've been. And how bad it's been. And how their life's been terrible. But when we become born again, all that is behind us. And we step into a new life, rise up and walk in the newness of life. So the gospel changes our appearance. We don't look like where we've been. And notice this young girl. He said, give her some food. The gospel changes our appetite. It changes our, our affections. When we are born again, we don't have the same desire. We don't have the same appetite. We don't have the same affections. Our affections are totally different. It changes the way we think and what we desire. It resets our desires and turns them to a different perspective. And that's where our desires and our affections are turned to God. And as we see this, we kind of look at all this and put all this together. And I think we have to ask the question. It kind of leads us to a closing of a question. Where are we at this morning? You know, maybe you've come to a point that you believe that your situation is just, just the way it is. And I think there's a lot of people get to this point. I believe there's a lot of Christians that get to this point. I believe that they, they go through life and they have this expectation of what God's going to do and how God's going to do it. And all of a sudden they go through these expectations. And you know, so many times you've heard me say this. God don't always work out the way that we think he work things out the way we think he should. But in our prayer life, you'll find if you listen to the way we pray, we are sometimes specific. And there's nothing wrong with praying specific. For a specific need, for a specific situation. But I don't think that we need to pray and tell God, this is the way I need you to answer this prayer specific. Because if I was God, Y'all are God. If somebody's going to dictate how we do it, what would we do? We'd probably do it different anyway. But the Bible says that God's ways are higher than our ways anyway. So if God's not going to, he's probably not going to do things the way we would do it. His mind is so much greater than ours, and he's going to work things out. Because we can't, you know, if we work it out, we got a day or two fix their problem. But God's looking for a long-term fix. He's looking for something bigger. We're praying for something big. But God's praying for something bigger. God's looking and God's asking for something bigger. And as we see this, maybe your situation you feel like is beyond repair. And you've come to this place in your life and you say, well, this is just how it's going to be. This is just the way it's going to be, so I'm just going to sit back in complacency. I'm just going to sit back and accept the fact that this is just how it's going to be. And we kind of put those limitations on God. And, you know, we, we go to this point and we say, okay, I'm just going to expect that. I'm just going to sit back. And I'm just going to have to deal with it. Now, I'm not saying God's going to fix every one of our situations. He didn't fix Paul's point in the flesh. He didn't fix that. But he told him, he said, my grace is sufficient. And you know, as you begin to see this, that didn't exempt Paul from continuing to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. That just gave him the, the, the ability to know that no matter what he was up against, that God had his back. That no matter what God had called him to do, that God would be with him. So as we begin to see this, we begin to understand that our situation don't give us an excuse just because things didn't work out the way we are to, to not attend church, to not to continue to serve the Lord, to not continue to have a relationship, to not continue to minister the gospel, not continue to be the disciple that God's called us to be. That don't give us that, that, that cop out, that excuse to do it. So we think about our situations, and, and, and as we think about when they don't turn out to be, maybe we just settle for the idea that, hey, that's just how it's going to be. And maybe, just maybe, we need to ask God to meet us at the point of our need. To meet us right where we left it at. And say, God, I was expecting something big, and it didn't happen. But God, I didn't realize you was expecting something bigger. God, could you meet me at my point of need? And let's pick up where we left off. Let's pick up and move past this situation. And you know, as we think about that, 
It would have been real easy for Jairus to have just walked away and went on home and buried his daughter. And sometimes in our Christian walk, it's just easier to walk away and bury the past and just settle for whatever's in the future. But God don't want us to settle. We don't serve a God that called us to settle for less than the best of God. We serve a God that's without limitation. We serve a God that is bigger than anyone, bigger than anyone or need that we can possibly labor for Him. And we want a God that, or we serve a God that wants us to persevere and to continue to have faith and continue to have hope. And it's, it, like I said, it would be real easy for Jerry to walk away. And sometimes it's real easy for us. It's easier for us sometimes to just walk away from our faith when it didn't turn out the way we thought it should. And we just have a mediocre faith than it is for us to blaze a new trail in Christ Jesus. And as we think about that, that's so many times where we kind of get stuck. That's where we fall in the rut. And, and maybe that's your mind. Maybe that's your situation. That, hey, you know, this is too big for God. And I've said I walk away. And I, I just want to kind of encourage you today. You think about that. Maybe you just need to ask, answer this question. What's your next step? Maybe you've come to a point of complacency in your life and say, well, you know, things didn't work out like I thought they would, and I guess this is just where God wanted to lead me at. No, that's not where God wanted to lead you at. God has a plan. God has a purpose. God didn't bring you this far to turn around and forget you and leave you hanging. It's going to happen. That's not, that's not who, uh, the God that we serve. He didn't begin a good work so he could just leave us hanging somewhere. He's going to finish that good work that he started in our life. So as we see that, we've got to ask ourselves the question, what's our next step? Now, I don't know, before we can take the next step, you know, we've got to take the first step. And I think there's, there's two groups of people here, two groups of people on Facebook, wherever you may be watching from, maybe we're out this morning, wherever you may be, there, there's two different groups. There's people that have taken a step in faith in Christ and met, and met Jesus Christ and asked Him to be Lord and Savior in their life. As we begin to embrace that and we've given our life to Christ, then there's other steps that we have to continue to take. It's a, it's a work in progress. It's a daily walking with Christ. And sometimes we walk and we walk and we walk until things don't work out like we think they should and all of a sudden that's where we stop and we sit down. But once we take that first step, it's the next step and the next step and the next step. And what's, what's our next step? What's our next step as Christians? What are we doing? Are we joining with God where He's at and working through Him, through the power of the Holy Spirit to be that disciple that He wants us to be? Or have we just kind of got displaced? But then though, there's those that have never taken a step. For whatever reason, the enemy has lied to you and led you to believe that you have gone too far, done too much, and, and God don't really love you, God don't care, He loves a lot of people, but you are not in that category. Well, that is contradictory to what the Word of God said. Because God said in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that none should perish, but all should come to repentance and have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. Who does that mean? Does that mean the world in that day? No, that means the world today, that day, forever, until He comes again. And as we begin to see that and understand that, we begin to realize that there's a lot of people that just don't believe that, that, that God really loved them enough that he would, he would go and send his son to a cross at Calvary. Now that may happen for a lot of people, but, but a lot of people just get this idea that I've done too much. I've done so much that there's no way that God can love me. And that guilt and that shame just continues to press down in their life. And they just come to a place where they would say, well, you know, I hope that I can come to church and I, I'm just going to try to, to come and, and ease the guilt. Stop the bleed. Ease the pain. And they never really embrace Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They never really come to the, the saving grace and step and take that first step in faith and trust Him as Lord and Savior. So where are we at today? I, I'm encouraging you, if you're here and you've already embraced Jesus Christ, and you need to take that next step in faith, whether it be water baptism, whether it be uh, a joining a local body of fellowship, whether it be finding your place of service, whether it be doing something that God has pricked your heart a long time ago and you say, no, God, I, I couldn't do that because I'm just 
I, I, I'm just not that kind of person. Maybe God has proved your heart today and got you to the point that you see Jerry's life and you know that God is a God without limitations. And if God's called you, he'll equip you. Or maybe you're here and you've just been lied to by the enemy. You, maybe you're listening this morning and you've just been lied to by the enemy. That there's no way God can love you that you've done too much. That is a lie. That is a lie from the very end of himself. <laughs> so here's the thing. This is what we want to do. We want to individually collect and we want to ask that question and often just answer it to yourself this morning. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what's going on in your life. I've not read your mail. I've not talked to you. I don't know what's going on in your life, but God does. And if you've got that little that little warm fuzzy feeling in your heart, that little bird, that little bird in there, that's not that's not me. That's God. And when we answer that question, when we begin to answer what He expects of us and what He wants us to do, when we begin to respond to Him, then He begins to meet us at that point of need in our life and He begins to reveal just how strong and powerful He is. So if you hear it, maybe you just neglecting to do some things that, that He's asked you to do, maybe you just come to a point of complacency. You need to say, hey, I'm not just going to turn around and go bury the things in my path. I'm going to rise up and I'm going to walk in the newness of life. I'm going to walk with Jesus. I'm going to take that next step. And I'm going to believe God is able to do measurably more than I could even think or have. Or maybe you're here and you've just never given your life to Christ. You know, I say it every week and I pray the prayer every week. It's not magical. It's not mystical. It's just a sincere, heartfelt prayer. Acknowledging that we are have fallen short. That we have not been able to make the mark. We have missed the mark. But Jesus Christ bridged the gap. Where our shortcomings kept us away from, the, from God, Jesus made up the difference. And Jesus, <clears throat> what he did on the work of the cross, and that, and that in and of itself, it's what we need to have a relationship with Jesus and to be able to spend eternity in the Father's house where he has prepared a mansion for us. So I'm going to pray this prayer. If, you, if you're here or, or if you're listening through Metro app or Facebook Live and you've never said to Jesus Christ that you would love to give your life to him this morning, we're just going to just say this simple prayer. God, I realize that I'm a sinner. And God, I realize that I need to say it. God, I missed the mark. I've tried behavior modification. I've tried to fix myself. I've tried to do it over and over and over and over again. But God, I've come to the realization that there's nothing I can do. But God, I need you to fix me. I need you to save me. I need you to forgive me in my sin. And write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life that I might have life a lot more abundantly than the work of the cross and what you did on the cross at Calvary. If you believe that in your heart and you confess that with your mouth, then Jesus Christ is faithful and just to save you. I'm going to pray that if you prayed that prayer, that God will encourage you to find you a local uh, Bible-believing church. I'm going to pray that God will encourage you to get in the fellowship of the saints and find you a, a group of people that you can fellowship with and, and they will hold each other accountable and pray together and seek the Lord together. And for those of us that have already made that, I pray that we'll be able to take that next step in Christ Jesus and we'll be faithful servants of God that he's called us to be. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that we might be able to look at you, trust in you for those things that we stand in need of. And I pray, God, for each one, whatever the situation may be this morning, for that one that has come to a place that, for whatever reason, they've just given up on church. God, we know it's not about church. It's all about you. God, let us, not, let us not give up on you because we've had a bad church experience. God, I pray that you just begin to work it through in our life, that we'll be compelled, that we'll be encouraged, that we'll be strengthened to take that next step in faith and to be that disciple that you call us to be. For those that have maybe prayed that prayer of faith this morning and given their life to you, God, I pray that they'll reach out, that we might be able to hear from them. We might be able to pray with them. That they may be able to to find a, a good Bible believing church, God, lead them to a place that, that they can serve. And God, I know there's so many that are listening across the world. We get a lot of viewers from all over this land. 
But God, I know that there's you've got churches everywhere. You've got good Bible believing, God fearing, Bible based churches. God, I pray that wherever they may be, if they pray that prayer of faith, that you would lead them to that church, that they may assemble with the saints, and that they might find comfort and resources to be able to do the work that you've called them to do. God, we thank you so much for that. We love you so much today, and we thank you for all that you do. We ask all these favors and blessings in Christ's true and holy name we do pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 So we great. See y'all today. Let's not.